what lies in their hearts, Jesus said, it eventually comes out. It'll come out of their mouth, yes, but it will be on display through their actions. You and I, we must be well aware of those that have a distressing spirit so that we can know how to deal with them so that we can know how to overcome them, if you understand what I mean today. Today, I say to you that you will be hated in this world. There is absolutely no doubt about it. You will be hated in this world. Whether it is because of the color of your skin, whether it is because of your hair being straight or curly, whether it is because you have money in the bank or don't have money in the bank, you will be hated in this world. Whether it is because of the way that you talk, or the way that you walk, or the way that you dress, you will be hated in this world. In scripture, we find that Jesus, he told the 11 that they would also be hated in the world because they chose to follow him. And so I say to all of you today that because you have chosen to follow Christ, you will be hated in the world. In other words, you will be hated because of your faith. So I ask you today, how do you react? How do you respond when you are hated? When someone hates you, how do you react? How do you respond? As we have seen in recent weeks, courage is required in order for us to step out and to move in faith. When we have the courage to move in faith, as we saw in my sermon last week, it has the power to inspire. It has the power to motivate all of those that are around us. When you move in faith, it has the power to inspire and to motivate all of those that are around you to also move in faith. Now, there is an opposite side of the coin to your moving in faith, where some will be inspired, where some will be motivated to move in faith, there are going to be others. And those others, they may respond, they may react differently to your moving in faith. You see, there are some that see you moving in faith that hate your moving in faith. There are some that will hate on you because you have the courage to step out in, you have the courage to move in faith. And again, I ask you today, how do you respond? How do you react? when someone hates on you because you have chosen to walk in faith in the Lord. When your haters hate on you, do you care? When someone hates you, do you have the courage to keep on moving in faith or do you let their hate get to you? How do you respond? How do you react? And I want you to keep it real with yourself. Don't you sit up high and mighty today in your response to that as you think on that today. Now, the popular answer is a response that shows us that we are built tough. The popular response to those questions is a response to say that, oh, hate doesn't get to me, preacher. Hate doesn't get to me, pastor. I just, I walk through that faith, that, that, that hate, because 
I'm built tough. You know, back in the day, we would say, well, when someone hates on, on, on me, we just, we, we just shake the dust off our shoulders. We don't let it get to us, is, is what we would say. But the harsh truth is that many of us, we let the hate of our haters, we let it get to us. And in it getting to us, we succumb to the hate of our haters. And succumbing to their hate, some of us, we become paralyzed because of their hate. What I mean by this is that we become fearful of what our haters will think of us. We become fearful of what our haters will say about us. We become fearful of what our haters might do to us because we have the courage to step out in and move in faith. Some of us on the opposite side of that thought when our haters hate on us, we let their hate get to us by stooping down to their levels. When I say that we stoop down to their levels, I want you to understand today that we succumb to their hate by acting in hate towards our haters. They cuss at us. We turn around and we say, oh, I ain't going to let you cuss at me. I'm going to cuss you out. They, they do something that is petty towards us. We say, oh, I ain't going to let them do something that's petty to me. I'm going out pet at them. I'm going to show them what I'm all about. And then guess what? We say that we are believers. We say that we are the children, a child of the Lord. But we stoop down. We lower ourselves down to the level of our haters. So again, with that in mind, I want to ask all of you, which of these two ways sounds right to you? Which of these two ways do you think is the best way to respond? Sitting down in your faith or answering hate with hate? Now, of course, we're going to shake our head out. Neither one of those ways sound right, Pastor. Neither one of those ways sound like the proper way for, for us to respond. But guess what? We do it. We the believers today, those that are watching, those that are listening, those that will read it because I write it out, <laughs> they, they, they'll, they'll come to realize, oh, yeah, I, I do do that, Pastor. You right. You ain't wrong on that. I can't even lie, Pastor. Many of us, we, we struggle mightily with making the proper choice the choice that we actually know is the right choice for the child of God to move in, for the sincere believer to actually move in when it comes to dealing with our haters. So I want to remind you, just in case you have forgotten what scripture says, we, the child of God, with the children of God, what we are to do when it comes to dealing with and overcoming our haters. Jesus, he taught us that we should do good to those that hate us. Remember that? Jesus said that we should pray for those that spitefully use, that we should pray for those that would even persecute us. Do you remember that? To the 12, Jesus, he told them that if one took their cloak, they shouldn't withhold their tunic. Look at that. Imagine doing that. And as I am sure we have all heard and that we all know, Jesus said that when one strikes us on this side of our face, that we are to turn the other cheek. We all remember that, don't we? We don't like that one, but I believe that we all remember that. So Jesus, in other words, he taught us that as God's children, we're not to answer hate with hate, right? This logic it is, of course, one that many of us, again, we struggle with. It is rather difficult for us to actually go about practicing the way that Jesus taught us to deal with 
and to overcome our haters. And the reason why that is, is because many of us, we have our limits. Many of us, we have our breaking points. Many of us, we snap right away. We don't have the patience when it comes to dealing with those that hate us. But I say to you today that we must learn to trust in the Lord. We must learn to trust God when it comes to our haters. Why must we learn to, to trust God when it comes to our haters? Well, let us remember what God said to the children of Israel when it came to dealing with those that hated them, when it came to dealing with those that would stand in opposition to them. God, he said to them that vengeance, it didn't belong to them. God said to the children of Israel that vengeance, it belonged to him. And he said to them that they didn't have to worry about repaying their vengeance. The Lord said that he would be the one to repay it. He said that to the children of Israel, but I want you to understand today that we, those who sincerely believe in the Lord today, we are his children as well. We have been made his children through our faith in his only begotten son. So that truth, as it stood for the children of Israel, it still stands today as truth for all of God's children. That is all of us. All of us who believe in the Lord today, we don't have to worry about vengeance when it comes to those that have wronged us. As we saw in our Sunday school lesson last week, we must learn the way of love, extending the love of God through forgiveness. As much as it pains us, we must learn the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is love. Now, with these things in mind, for a good example today, when it comes to dealing with our haters and overcoming our haters, I want to take a look at my dad's favorite today. My dad's favorite was David. I want to take a look at David and how David, how he dealt with one that truly despised him. I want to take a look at how David dealt with and overcame the one that hated his guts. Now, you may be sitting and you may be wondering, well, who was it that hated David's guts? Who was it that despised David? Well, as we'll see here in the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel uh, today, we'll see that it was King Saul. Saul, he had a hatred of David. And I tell you all today, that Saul's hatred of David was as real as it gets. You see, Saul's hatred of David, it stemmed from the rip in his relationship with the Lord. You see, at one point in time, Saul was actually in good standing with the Lord. But if you happen to turn over to the 13th chapter of 1 Samuel, you'll see where Saul, he committed an unlawful sacrifice. And after he sinned that sin, the Lord was essentially through with him. And Samuel spoke to Saul and he shared God's message with Saul and that Saul was set to lose the kingdom. That is the kingdom of Israel. He was the king of Israel. He would lose the kingdom. It would no longer abide within his house because of his wickedness. Now, at first, when Saul met the shepherd boy, when he met David, he was happy with David. And the reason why he was happy with David was because David, he slayed Goliath. He had the guts, the courage to, to go out and face Goliath when the rest of the army of Israel was too afraid to face the giant. However, over time, we'll see that Saul, he began to despise. He began to hate David. We'll see here in the 18th chapter of first Samuel there in the 10th verse, we are told that a spirit of distress came upon Saul. Now look at what this spirit of distress, 
Look at what it calls Saul to do here. We're told here that this distressing spirit, it calls Saul to prophecy. Now, I want you to understand that the prophecy that Saul was doing was not according to the Lord. He was not prophesying on God's behalf. He was prophesying from that distressing spirit. So the words that Saul was saying were crazy. In other words, Saul, he was speaking mad, if you will, out of his mind, if you will. Now we'll see here, there in the 11th verse, that, that Saul's, his, his crazy thoughts, his, his crazy speech, we'll see that they eventually turned into, guess what? Crazy actions. Saul's, his, his, his hatred, it, it moved towards evil intent, as scripture shows us here where he took a spear into his hands, we we're told there. He drew the spear back, and we see him hurl it in the direction of David. We're told there that he had the intent. We see his intent here. It's told to us plainly here that Saul wanted to pin David to the wall with his spear. In other words, Saul, he wanted to kill David. He was moving with malicious, evil intent from that distressing spirit. You know, like I said, Saul, he hated David's guts. His hate for David was as real as it get since he desired to kill David. Now, let me, let me just say something to you all today on, on a side note here. You and I, we need to be well aware of those that have a distressing spirit. You and I, we need to be well aware of those that utter complete nonsense. Those that talk madly. Those that talk out of their mind. Those that, that talk crazy. The, the reason why I say this is because what lies in their hearts, Jesus said, it eventually comes out. It'll come out of their mouth, yes, but it will be on display through their actions. You and I, we must be well aware of those that have a distressing spirit so that we can know how to deal with them so that we can know how to overcome them. If you understand what I mean today. You see, those who think that way, those who speak that way, those who then begin to move that way, they can inspire others to think as they do, to speak just like they do to act just like they do. And y'all know I'm not making it up. We see it today and we see it throughout history as well. You and I get, we must be well aware of those who have that distressing spirit so that we can know how to deal with them so that we can know how to overcome them. Now, again, with that in mind, let's take a look at what inspired Saul's hate of David. We need to understand today why we are hated. So what was it about David that drove Saul to, to hate him so much? What becomes clear for us there from the fifth through the ninth verse, if you're taking a look at the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel, what becomes clear in those verses is that Saul hated that David was successful. Saul hated that David was successful. Think on that for a moment as we go through these verses here. After, seeing, after setting David over the men of war, we're told there in the sixth verse, scripture tells us of an occasion where David, he was returning back home after the slaughter of the Philistines. Now for David, we'll see that this was a very joyful return back home. 
we'll see that there was singing, there was dancing, we're told. Specifically, we're told that we'll see there in the seventh verse that the women, that they were dancing and that they sang out. It was supposed to be a welcome back home for Saul as well. But we'll see there in those verses that the women, they sang out about how Saul had slain his thousands. But look at what they said about David. They sang about how David had slain his ten thousands. <laughs> Do you know what the applaud, the cheers, the sing? Essentially, they're praising David. Do you know what that did to Saul? You see, after all, Saul, he was the king, right? David was just a soldier, really. That's all that he was. You see, Saul, in his mind, he was the one that, that the women should have been singing about. He was the one that the people should have been running out to praise, right? But, but here they are, they singing to old David. That, that guy that was the shepherd boy. They singing about him. Man, I, they, they said I only killed a thousand. You hear them? They said that I, I killed a thousand. And then they said, David, kill, how can he kill 10,000? How do you do that? I don't know how he did that, you know. <laughs> they didn't even sing it about that. They just saw my man, you know. I'm with you there, Auntie, though. I imagine there was some singing about that as well. And so we'll see there in the eighth and ninth verse that, that scripture tells us plainly that Saul was very angry. He was upset. We're told that it, 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 it displeased him, right? To hear David being praised more than him. Again, I tell y'all today that Saul hated David's guts. And we'll see it plain and clear here that he hated David because David was more successful than him. Now, why was David, why was he more successful than Saul? What was the difference between these, these two? The difference between these two was their relationship with the Lord. The difference between these two, in other words, were their faith. You see, let us remember that David is one that sought the Lord early. He said in the 63rd Psalm that his soul, that it thirsted for the Lord. When Samuel spoke to Saul about the kind of man that the Lord would want to be king of Israel over his people, Samuel told Saul that the Lord will want someone who is after his heart, who is after, in other words, his spirit, that had the same kind of spirit as the Lord. You see, David, he was hand-selected by the Lord. And the reason why David was hand-selected by the Lord was because David, he met God's criteria. You see, David's heart was like that of the Lord. In other words, David had a spirit that was like God's spirit. Do you have a spirit that's like the Lord's spirit today resting in you? I hope today, if you say that you are a believer, I hope today that you do. Now, Saul, on the other hand, he didn't have a heart that was truly for the Lord which is why he could not enjoy the same successes as David did. To make matters worse for himself, Saul, he recognized that God was not with him, but was with David. Again, we see this here in scripture today. After David managed to dodge the spear that Saul had through his way with the intent of pinning him against the wall, we're told there in the 12th verse that Saul was afraid of David because he realized right then and there that the Lord, that God was with David. 
Saul, I want you to understand today that it wasn't even just the success of David that was behind his hatred of David. Saul hated David because he recognized that David was blessed and highly favored. Do you see that there? Saul couldn't stand David's guts because he realized that David was blessed and highly favored. So I want you to take all of that in for a moment. Let us take in Saul's hatred of David for a moment. And then let us think to ourselves for, for just a minute here what all of this means for us as children of the Lord, as sincere believers, living in a world that despises us, living in a world that hates our guts. Why do you suppose that the world hates you? I want you to understand that your haters will hate on you because they not only see that you have the courage to step out in and to, to move in faith, but they too come to the same realization that Saul came to about us. They see that you are blessed and highly favored in God's eyes. They see that you are loved by the Lord. And because they see that you're blessed and highly favored, because they see that God loves you, they hate your guts. They will hate on you. Get this part of it today. You can be of great fortune. And those, again, who are of the world, if you are of great fortune and you are of faith, they will hate you. They will find some kind of way to try to tear you down if you are of great fortune. They don't stop there. Get this one. I'm a man that's not of great fortune. I don't have any riches. But even if you are of less fortune, those who are of the world, when they see that you have the courage to keep on moving in faith, when they see that you are blessed and highly favored, when they see your joy, when they see your happiness, when they come to realize that you are going about in life through all the ups and downs of life, through all that the world can, can throw your way, when they see that joy emanating from you, when they see the joy of God emanating from you, they going to frown. They going to hate. They going to look at you and wonder why you still walking around in this world with nothing, but you got a smile on your face because God has made you glad. They will hate on you because you are of faith and that the Lord has rewarded you of your faith. You are blessed and highly favored. And as Saul hated David, as Saul despised David, they will despise you and they will try to take away your joy. They will do everything that they can to knock you down to tear you down so that you are not happy, so that you are not content in your soul. When you are blessed by God, when you are highly favored, I feel I need to touch on this for a moment because I feel like there's always confusion and a misunderstanding about being blessed, what it means to be blessed and what it means to be highly favored. As you have heard me say before, you don't have to have a great amount of wealth to be blessed and highly favored in the eyes of the Lord. David, he again is proof of this. When David was anointed to be king of Israel over God's people, he was just a shepherd boy. He didn't have anything. He was still living under his father's house, under his roof. He didn't have great wealth. 
But David, he was blessed and he was highly favored. Why was he blessed and highly favored? Because his heart again was for the Lord. When you are blessed by God, this means that the Lord has made you so happy in your heart that you become content. When you are filled with God's contentment in your heart, again, that happiness, it will be seen. That happiness, it will be recognized. Now, some will rejoice and be inspired at the sight of you being blessed and you being highly favored. But again, others, they will move as Saul did. And again, the question still remains for us. How do we deal with and how do we overcome those that will hate on us? Let's take a look at this further here today. Now, the mere thought of someone moving to tear you down just because you are blessed and highly favored by the Lord, it might make you feel a certain way. And so we'll see here that we need to keep looking at how David moved when it was Saul that hated his guts. After the attempt on his life, Saul, we're told that in the 13th verse, he made David a captain over a thousand. David, he could have resented Saul, right? David, he could have did to Saul what Saul tried to do to him. However, here in my key verse for today, we are told that David, he behaved a certain way. We're told that David, that he behaved wisely in all his ways. So what does that mean? What does it mean that David, he, he behaved wisely in all his ways? Well, in the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel, Scripture shows us that a moment actually presented itself to David to where he could have moved differently against Saul, where he could have acted unwisely. But again, David, he acted wisely. So let's see what let's see what he did there. Now, during the days of Saul's obsession with David, David, he would flee. He would run away from Saul. He would run to to many different places. But Saul, he was so obsessed in his hatred of David that he would pursue after David again with the intent of of killing the man that he hated. Scripture, it again, often encourages us to remove ourselves from wickedness, just as David did here. But often wickedness, it has a habit of trying to follow us around, doesn't it? Those that hate us, they, they often seem to always be around us, just as the Pharisees were around Jesus, right? Now, Saul's pursuit, it, it led him to the wilderness of En Gedi. We're told here in the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel, if you turned over with me, where he was there with 3,000 chosen men, again, for the intent, the purpose of killing David. Now, Scripture tells us that David and his men, they were staying in the recesses of a cave there in the third verse. They were there in the wilderness of En Gedi, but they were in a cave. That was not known to Saul. Now, David and his men, again, they could have took the opportunity right then and there to get the jump on Saul and his men without them even knowing that they were there. Some of David's men, we'll see in the 10th verse, actually, they had even tried to encourage David to do just that. But David didn't do it. Saul, we're told in this passage of scripture that he even entered into the cave that David and his men were in. He didn't know that they were there. And without even realizing it, David was able to sneak up on Saul and he was able to cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He could have killed Saul right then in there, but he didn't do it. He refrained from doing it. He just cut off his robe without Saul even realizing it. So again, David, he could have returned Saul's wickedness. He could have returned his actions of hatred with hate of his own, right? But we're told here that he didn't do it. He refused to harm Saul. And the reason why he would do this is because he saw Saul as God's anointed. 
He had been anointed to be king of Israel. And David would not move against God's anointed. So we're told here that when Saul exited the cave and when he went out a short distance away, we're told here in the 8th through the 11th verse there that David, he exited the cave and he called out to the king. He called out to Saul. And when Saul turned around to see that David was there in that cave that he was just in, you can imagine that his eyes got real big. Then David showed him a piece of the corner of the robe that he had cut. And his already bigger eyes got even bigger. Because David was right there and he had the opportunity to act as Saul had been acting. But we'll see there that, again, David, he chose not to do so because he said to Saul there in that passage of Scripture that there was no evil or rebellion in his hands. David was saying, there is no hate in my hands towards you. Well, what was it that was in David's hands? Do you recognize what was the wise behavior of David? do you recognize what that wise behavior was composed of? Because this behavior is, again, how we deal with and how we overcome our haters. David's wise behavior, I want you to understand today, that it was made up of peace. Peace, I want you to understand today, it is made up of God's love. Not peace of this world, I'm talking about God's peace. God's peace is made up of his love. The way that you and I deal with, the way that you and I overcome those that hate on us, it has been illustrated for us through David here. Just as Paul said, as much as it depends on us, we are to live peaceably with all of those that are around us. The only way I say to you today that you can do that is if the love of God is in you. If you want to overcome your haters, if you want to be able to deal with your haters, you have to move in peace towards them. The only way that you can overcome, the only way that you can deal with your haters is if the love of God is in you. Do you hear me here today? I want you to understand today that behaving wisely, it does not include sitting down in fear. Just because someone despises you, just because someone hates you, doesn't mean that you stop moving in faith. No, you should remember that the Lord has not given you a spirit of fear. He has given you a spirit of power a spirit of love. So when your haters hate on you, again, you should keep moving in the faith of God's love. Behaving wisely, I want you to understand today, it does not stoop down to the level of your haters. Don't you stoop down to the level of your haters. You should understand that God has not given to you, the sincere believer, a distressing spirit. God has given to you an encouraging spirit. He has given to you a motivational spirit. He has given to you a spirit of love. He has given to you a spirit that does not hate. He has given to you a spirit that uplifts. Do you understand me today? So let us not move to lower ourselves down to the level of our haters. As Michelle Obama said, I'm going to borrow from you today, Michelle. When they go low, we don't go down there with them. When they go low, we go high. That's what she said, and that's truth. Those are words that's inspired through Scripture as we see here today. Again, you and I, we must be mindful. We must always be mindful of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is what abides in us. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us out of love. 
So behaving wisely means that you and I should move with humility. We should move with humility even towards those that hate us, those that despise us, those that can't stand us. In the book of Proverbs, you will read something that Jesus also taught us about behaving wisely and doing good to those that despise us. In the 25th chapter of Proverbs, the 21st and the 22nd verse, we are told that if our enemy is hungry, we should give them bread to eat. We're told that if they're thirsty, we should give them water to drink. You see, when we treat our enemies this way, when we treat them out of humility, when we treat them out of love, the proverb tells us that we will heap coals of fire on their heads and God will reward us when we move in that manner. Now, what does it mean when, when we treat those with love, when we, when we treat them in that manner and it heaps coals of fire on their heads? What does that say mean to us? What does that proverb mean to us? Well, what that means is that those who move in hatred towards us, when we show them love, they'll move in and they'll begin to think to themselves, why is this guy loving me? Why is this woman loving me? All I've done is move against them. The coals of fire on their head will be great shame. It will be embarrassment. Think about it for a moment. How can you hate someone that's being nice to you? How can you hate someone that is doing nothing but showing love to you? It eats you up on the inside. It'll tear you up. Those that hate, those that despise you, they may try to ignore it, but their spirit will eat them up. It'll consume them when you're doing nothing but showing them grace, when you're doing nothing but showing them the love of God. Some are truly evil and they'll ignore it. They'll keep on, they'll keep on going. But we should keep on going and moving in sincere faith by moving with the love of God. My encouragement for all of you today is just that. Keep moving in faith. When your haters hate on you, don't stop believing. Don't, don't stop moving in faith in the Lord. When your haters hate on you, keep having courage. That's all I've preached about this month, courage. Keep having courage to move in faith. When your haters hate on you, keep your head up. You have nothing to be afraid of. Because again, as we've seen here today, God is on your side, just as he was on the side of Joshua, as he was on Deborah's side, as we have seen here today with David, God is on your side. And again, when you continue to move in faith, you will please the Lord, you will be blessed and highly favored, and our God, my God, he will reward you. Amen. 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 Amen.